The year is 1998. The Sony PlayStation and the Nintendo 64 have been in full swing with their development life cycles and will continue for another few years. Sega, with their announcement of the Dreamcast and release in Japan on November 27th, 1998, comes out with a new concept and much improved 3D graphics over the current generation. However, something was done a little bit differently. Taking from the Nintendo 64's playbook, an external peripheral to save games called the Virtual Memory Unit was designed to be placed into the controller, but there was a twist. There were little mini games on it and a little LCD display that would display messages and was interactive with game saves. Sony decided to fire back, and they came up with the Sony Pocket Station. Hi everybody, I'm James from Zygle Studios, and today we're going to talk about the Sony Pocket Station hardware. When you think of the PlayStation, the first name that usually pops up isn't the Pocket Station, and there's a number of reasons for that. The Pocket Station was launched on January 23rd, 1999, and it was Japan only. The Sony PlayStation already had external non-volatile memory units plugged into the memory card slot inside the console. So this means that the Pocket Station had to be plugged into the console in order to transfer games to and also save data information. So you can carry around your save games as well as all the games to play on the Pocket Station itself. But they also shared the same memory banks, so this means that you had to sacrifice some save data space if you wanted to have games on there. Let's start talking about the hardware. Here's a general overview of the Sony Pocket Station. The CPU is an ARM7T, which is a 32-bit RISC chip, more on that later. It also had 2K of SRAM and 128K of flash. The screen was a 32 by 32 dot monochrome LCD, which allowed for simple but effective games, and the sound had a 10-bit PCM chip on it, with a very small speaker. There were only six buttons. You had a reset button, one action button, start button, whatever you want to call it, up, down, left, and right. And that was about it. And there was some type of infrared communication for some remote control support, and there was of course an LED to indicate power, and you needed a battery, more specifically a CR2032. But Sony wanted this to be more than just a little game made to hold saves, there was also a calendar function, and it had a unique identification number. While there were some special additions, it pretty much just came in the same package. The trouble was, in order to utilize this, game developers had to write functionality in the games in order for this to work. So there's only a specific list of games that are compatible with this guy. Let's take a look at the CPU. The ARM7T, or the ARM7 series, is the predecessor to the Cortex-M, which is actually what I program on quite a lot. The Cortex-M's ingenious design revolves around a small pipeline and a small transistor size package. This means that there's less power to be consumed and pipeline stalls are minimized. And this ARM7 design is no different. The ARM7 series uses von Neumann architecture, meaning that there's the typical fetch, decode, and operate cycles. In this case, it's known as the fetch, decode, and execute, and these are the three pipeline stages. The fetch involves fetching the instruction from memory, the decode involves decoding the registers that are used based on the instructions, and then the execute sends it off to the ALU, and then eventually writes back to the register. Memory access is done with a single 32-bit data read, carrying both instructions and data. Only load, store, and swap instructions can access data from memory, and words have to be aligned on 4-byte boundaries. This is also something that's common with the Cortex-M. Half words have to be aligned to 2-byte boundaries. The instruction set that's supported is the typical ARM7 instruction set, and it includes some thumb instructions as well. With this choice of processor, this means that the pocket station could consume as little power as possible, while containing quite a bit of RAM and also flash. Flash was pretty expensive at this time, so 128 kilobytes was no slouch. So essentially this multi-purpose CPU was configured with some of these peripherals and was just a microcontroller. I mean, really all it was looking for was six button inputs, one speaker, one monochrome LCD, and that was pretty much it. Other than an alarm clock, calendar, and a unique ID number, this thing didn't do much more than transfer game saves and that was really about it. But the drawing of the pixels on the screen was probably the most interesting part of this. Since this is a 32 by 32 monochrome LCD display, this means that there's 1024 pixels that can be drawn. Pixels are represented in binary in this case, with 0 being white and 1 being black. The 32 by 32 dot monochrome LCD matrix is made up of 1024 bits that you can set and unset by writing two UNT32s to video memory. By using two UNT32s, one to represent the X direction and the other the Y direction, you could use hexadecimal to represent images that would have pixels on and off. The memory was arranged in reverse order, which isn't uncommon for LCD displays, so you basically had to shift everything by 31. In this case, the translation would be a subtraction. 
With typical bit manipulations, this is usually not the case. However, so a subtraction by 31 needs to be performed. So if we wanted to set the 0th bit or position 00, zero we would actually set position 31 in both the X and the Y. This 32-bit processor was more than overkill for just flipping bits. Processing and sending these bits to the screen would have only consumed about 5% of the CPU's resources. And this is even with writing every single pixel to the screen. And with clever programming, you could probably get that down even further. Much like every other time-constrained game system or peripheral, there were bugs, and also some pretty frustrating things to deal with it during development. The compiler and debugger from SN System were pretty good, but had a few drawbacks. Especially the compiler. One frustrating thing was that the compiler didn't really have a good understanding of signed comparisons. So this means that in logical statements like ifs or switch cases, you couldn't use signed numbers because it couldn't differentiate a signed number from an unsigned number. While math like addition and subtraction worked okay, a signed multiply simply would not. However, if you were able to use some type of fixed point math trick, like adding a large quantity to the number in order to do the comparison, that actually worked. So the general consensus was pretty much to avoid negative numbers altogether. As a typical good programming practice in C, you should initialize all your variables, especially on an embedded platform. But global non-constant variables were never initialized. It's a pretty easy fix, just set it equal to whatever you want it to start at. And byte arrays weren't initialized either, if they were global. So if it wasn't thrown on the stack and was in the BSS code segment, even if it was considered to be static and constant, it wouldn't be initialized. So you need to use some type of memset in order to send these in the right direction. And unfortunately, this means that a uint8 or an unsigned character data type is unreliable in code. So using pointers and things like that probably weren't the best practice. Since this is a 32-bit system anyway, using uint32s was probably your best bet. 2K of RAM is plenty of room in order to do most of these operations. The pocket station also had a clock peripheral, and it was in binary coded decimal. The button interrupts were hooked up directly to the ARM chip. GPIO pins would have to be set as inputs in order for these button interrupts to fire, and the button memory is configured around the GPIO pins that are connected to them in the schematic. There was a process that you had to go through in order for these interrupts to be fired, and it's very typical of embedded systems, and the Cortex-M actually uses a pretty similar system now. The idea was to write a interrupt handler, or a function callback, inside of your C code, so when that interrupt fires, that's where it points in memory. You had to register it in the system interrupt table. New Cortex-M devices, generally most of them now in microcontrollers, have nested vector interrupt controllers that prioritize interrupts based on what you set in software. And you can register the callbacks based on that interrupt table. But in this case, there is no vectored interrupt controller, so it's basically one by one execution. After that, activate the desired interrupt and deactivate it when the program exits, so there's no hairy stuff coming on the way back in. Typically, this is done by a bootloader, which deinitializes and then reinitializes the peripherals upon entry again. It was a clever little system, and it isn't uncommon of something you'd see even nowadays, and it makes me wonder what the pocket station would be like if it was developed in 2020. Hmm, maybe there's a future there. I hope you enjoyed this video on the Sony Pocket Station. It definitely had its place in the market for the time, and it was a cool little device, and there's still a small cult following today. This is James from Zygol Studios, signing off.